home to our or your own experience you may be right now s suffering from a disease or know somebody who is we live in a world that is full of pain and suffering if you listen to to to, uh, to the news watch tv or radio or internet or whatever the only good news coming through the airwaves this day seems to be the claim that a 15 minute call can save you 15 percent or more on car insurance <laughs> There isn't much good news in this world. So what does the Bible have to say to us as human beings, and how does it help us in that condition, especially when we are dealing with this issue of, uh, of, of, of these four questions that every worldview must and needs, needs to answer? So what we are going to do now is, uh, again, to show it, to try and, and convince you that this is a biblical question in a very, very powerful way. Now, I know of no better example in the, anywhere in the scripture, in the Bible or outside the Bible, than the example given to us by our Savior Jesus Christ during his last days on this earth. So, we'll be looking at a, at a passage in John chapter 13. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. But before we read it, I'm just going to set the stage so we can, we can appreciate, uh, we can have a better appreciation for what is going on in this passage. The context is the very last days of our Savior Jesus Christ on this earth. We enter into his life during the night in which he was betrayed and arrested. And almost in passing, the author of this gospel, John, gives us four powerful reasons why Jesus, Jesus was able to do some amazing things that he did, that he did in, this, in this passage. Because John chapter, chapter 13, all the way to chapter 17, is really one long conversation Jesus had with his, with his disciples the night he was betrayed and arrested. And like I said, almost in passing, John gives us some amazing things that we'll be looking at that are very well connected with, the, with our introduction to apologetics, with these four questions that we are dealing with here. So what is going on in this passage in John chapter uh, 13? John tells us in verse 21 that Jesus was troubled in spirit. This was a very difficult time in the life of our Savior Jesus Christ. He was troubled in spirit. One of his own disciples was going to betray him. And he knew this was going to happen. And the rest of his disciples would abandon him in the hour of his greatest need. And again, Jesus knew that this was going to be happening this same night. And then later that night, he'll be sweating large drops of blood, praying that a particular cup may be taken away from him. And again, he knew that this was going to happen. And the following day would be the worst of his life, as he would be flogged and then forced to carry a large beam of wood on which he would be nailed and then hanged naked outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And again, he knew this was going to happen. And perhaps worst of all, he would experience an abandonment from God the Father. And we, we don't quite understand exactly what happened, but the creeds put it in this term, in these terms, he, descend, he descended into hell. This was a very difficult moment for our Savior because he knew that all this was going to happen. And from the cross, he would cry out, Eli, Eli, la masa bakhtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Again, Jesus knew that all this was going to be happening. And yet, this same night is a night that he chose to wash the feet of the disciples. Have you ever thought about this? Have you ever asked yourself how in the world he could do it? If there was ever a time when Jesus could be excused for choosing to focus on himself, to think about himself, it was this night. And yet he chose this moment to wash the feet of the disciples. Now we normally rush to this passage to, te to teach the topic of servant leadership. That's obviously there, but when we do that, we skip the way John introduces this topic, and then we miss the value of the questions that we are dealing with in this, in this series. So um, now we need to appreciate how extraordinary what Jesus did this night was, for washing the feet of the disciples. Uh, if you look at the writings of the time among the Greeks or among the Jews, you are not going to find an example anywhere of a master washing the feet of the disciples. Actually, in Jewish context, you find statements such as the following. All manner of service that a slave must render to his master, a student must render to his teacher, except that of taking off his shoe. And, and again, a Hebrew slave must not wash the feet of the disciple, a Hebrew slave must not wash the feet of his master, nor put his shoes on him. 
when John the, the John the Baptist chose the, the 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 most demeaning thing he could think about as as the slave could do, he talked about untying the sandals of the master. He was not fit. He was not worthy to untie the feet. I mean the sandals uh, on the feet of Jesus. Washing the feet was considered to be such a menial and demeaning task that no Hebrew slave was even expected to do it. During this last supper, when this incident took place here, there is what, it was only Jesus, Jesus and his disciples. They had walked into this home and they had, the, the disciples had prepared the meal. And so it was just Jesus and his disciples. There was no servant there to wash, to wash, to wash anybody's feet, but the feet needed to be washed. So Jesus chose picks this moment to teach them a lesson they would never forget because on their way here, they had been arguing among themselves about which one of, the, one, which one of them was the greatest. But the question I'm interested in once again is this, how in the world could Jesus be thinking like this, doing this kind of thing, as the Bible says in this passage, as we'll see in a minute, he showed them the full extent of his love, given the condition that he was in, how could he do that? Now you might be tempted to say to me, uh, come on, Mr. Preacher, Jesus was God and he could do anything. Now, it is true that Jesus was God, but that response would be mistaken for a couple of reasons. Number one, in verse 15, Jesus says this, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. He expects you and me to be able to do this kind of thing even in the worst, uh, in the worst moment of our lives. Secondly, that excuse will not work for another reason. If we look throughout history, what we find is this. God's people have served him in some of the most unimaginable conditions, and they, st they have still excelled in their commitment to who God is. I remember the reading of, a, of an ad that appeared in a newspaper in the 19th century in Paris as they were looking for missionaries to come to the New World. This is what the ad said. Listen to this and tell me what would happen if you put an ad like this today in a newspaper. It says this. We offer you no salary, no recompense, no holidays, no pension, but much hard work, a poor dwelling, small consolations, many disappointments, frequent sickness, a violent or lonely death, and an unknown grave. And those missionaries signed up in droves to come to the new world. God's people have served him in some of the most difficult circumstances in this world, and they have excelled in their service to him. That's why we get uh, poems such as the following, written by a missionary. We the unwilling, led by the unknowing, are doing the impossible for the ungrateful. We have done so much for so long. With so little, we are now qualified to do anything with nothing. People are interested in having a spiritual life, but treat faith more like an a la carte menu at a restaurant, choosing what they like and dismissing the rest. Cutting through the hype and seduction is the clear voice of author and apologist Ravi Zacharias. In his book, Why Jesus? Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass-Marketed Spirituality, Ravi answers the attraction known as the new spirituality. Billy Graham calls Why Jesus a powerful defense of how Jesus Christ brings meaning and hope to an individual life. And Charles Swindoll says, I am not acquainted with a brighter mind or a more relevant and devoted defender of the faith than Ravi Zacharias. Why Jesus, available in bookstores now or online at rzim.org. We quickly run out of excuses when we see what God's people have done for him throughout history. So they've been able to do what Jesus did at that moment. So how in the world did this happen? How could it happen for Jesus, for these other people? And how can it happen for you and for me? John is writing these words many years after that incident in the upper room. He has had the time to reflect on what happened there. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives us four reasons in the first five verses why Jesus was able to do what he did. So if you have your Bible open to John chapter 13, we are now ready to read the passage. John 13, we begin reading from verse 1. This is what it says. It was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew, that the Father had, that Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Verse 3. Jesus knew, by, by the way, uh, three, three of the reasons are all packed in, in this verse. Verse 3. 
And then uh, the first one comes, the, first, the fourth reason comes first, but we'll save that for last because it, in a sense it ties everything together. So here, here, here it goes. Verse 3. Jesus knew, number one, that the Father had put all things under his power. Number two, he had come from God. And number three, he was returning to God. So he got up. For that reason, because of that, because of what he knew, verse 4, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. That is his mission in life. His mission in life was clearly defined. He knew his mission. Number two, he knew that he had come from God. That is his origin. He knew he had come from God. That is his origin. And number three, he knew that he was returning to God. That is his destiny. He was returning to God, his destiny. His mission, origin, and destiny. So we are going to spend the the first half of, the, of, our, of our time, looking at the, those first uh, um, two, two reasons, and then we'll, we'll finish with destiny because it's the main focus of this last session. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Number one, his mission. His mission. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his feet. His mission in life was very clearly defined. Now, what is your mission in life? Your life mission is what you take to be the most important thing about you and why you exist in this world. It consists of at least two things. It consists of what you value, what you value, and that's, that's, that's morality, and what, why you think you exist, and that's, that's meaning. Morality and meaning are tied into this question of, of mission. Now, most people never really take the time to sit down and ask themselves the question, why it is that they exist. They just move on with their lives and pursue things that they find interesting. The problem is this. We all come into this world predisposed to walk away from God. We come to this world already predisposed to walk away from God. So if we are really going to find our purpose and our mission in this world, it is not going to happen by chance. It has to be a purposeful decision that we make for us to be able to find, to come up with the, with the purpose for which we were put in this world. Determining why it is that we are in this world is the most important thing any of us can be able to do. Perhaps one of the worst things that can happen to a human being is this, that we actually succeed in something that we are pursuing before we have learned how to submit to God. Mm. Because when we do that, when we succeed at something before we have learned to submit to God, that can very easily become a weapon that we use to fight against not just others, but also against God because we think we are in control of our own destiny. One of the uh, privileges that we get um, traveling as much as we do is getting to hear stories about different people, talking to people and hearing just their life stories. I remember sitting across the table from a man who was extremely successful. He told me that all the, all the goals he set for himself when he was younger, he said he had achieved all of them. He wanted to live in a particular neighborhood. He said he had several homes like that, driving particular kinds of cars with people in certain level of society as his friends. And he told me he had achieved all of those goals. And he was, this, he was not a pagan. He was an elder in a church. And then he said to me something that was very, very sad. This man had been in the church serving as an elder for, for much longer than I had been uh, alive. But he said this to me. I have achieved every goal that I set for myself, but I want you to know this. Today, I would give it all back if I could have another chance at being a husband to my wife and a father to my children. There was no way you could look at this man from the outside and say that he had done anything wrong. You know, the most difficult time for you and me to make the right decision is when all the options before us are good ones. Because at that moment, nobody can look at you and say you're doing anything wrong because all the choices look good. You're working hard and providing for your family and all that. And everything you choose to do looks good. That's the most difficult time for us to make the right decision. Choosing between right and wrong is easy. We don't always choose to do the right thing, but that's an easy decision. But when all the options are in front of you and they are all good, 
it becomes very hard for us to stick with the right thing. But if you have a mission in life, if you have a purpose for your existence, if you have that meaning uh, that has already been talked, out, talk, talked about, you can be able to discern between what is good and what is excellent. And be, you can be able to pursue what is excellent, what would grow you and make you the kind of person that you have been called to be. Now for Jesus, his mission in life was very clearly Defined. He came into this world with a very clearly defined mission. Remember when he was about 12 years old and his parents had left him uh, in, in, the, in the temple for three days. When they finally found him, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? What did he say? Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be about my father's business? He knew at that age that he was, about, he was, he was to be about his father's business. And what does he say at the end of his life? It is finished. He accomplished that mission. He came into this world with a very clearly defined mission. And the Bible is telling us here in this, in this passage that, that that's part of what made it possible for Jesus to do what he did in, some, in one of the, the most difficult moments of his life. Um, so that I won't spend too much time on that because it's been covered in detail. So let's go to the second thing, which is uh, uh, his origin. He knew that he had come from God. His mission was clear, and he also knew that he had come from God. Now, this question of origin is probably the most important question that uh, students, for example, on university campuses face today. It's being discussed all over, all over the world. Are we here by unguided processes, or are we here by divine decree? How did we end up here as human beings? How did we end up where we are today? This is an issue that is of the utmost importance because how we answer this question determines how we deal with each other as human beings. Many of the battles that we are fighting today uh, in, in, in the culture, from euthanasia to abortion, to genetic engineering and all that, from the nature of marriage and the nature of sexuality to, uh, to the sex trafficking and uh, industry and, and slavery and all that, all these issues have to do with how we answer this question about who this, who we are as human beings. It's not possible. It is very difficult to look at another human being and see this person as one made in the image of God, whom God loves and cares about, and still violate the person. But when we see other people as objects that we can use for our own gratification, it becomes much easier for us to dehumanize them and to deal with them as though they mean nothing. And if you look at the atrocities that we've been able to, 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 uh, to conduct on other people, what you find is that we begin by dehumanizing them. And when we do that, when we don't recognize their origin, then it becomes very easy for us to commit those atrocities. For example, I've spoken a, a few times in, in Rwanda, and you can just see it in the faces of the people as they tell you about what happened in 1994 during the genocide, that they were being referred to as cockroaches. And many of them are still having a hard time today recovering from that experience of being dehumanized. One of, I will never forget what a pastor said to me in, in Rwanda when I was done speaking. He said, one of the biggest problems I have in this church is I have people, members of my congregation, who do not know how to laugh. I have never seen them laugh because of what happened in their lives. And of course, the Nazis refer to the Jews as vermin. And today, we refer to the unborn as fetuses. And then it becomes easier for us to do away with them. We begin by dehumanizing other people. So this issue of origin is a very, very important one. Now, how do other worldviews, I, mean, I talked about these other worldviews and, and, and the fact that they are all designed to answer these questions. How do they answer this issue of origin and who we are and all that? Now, one of the questions we get all the time everywhere we go is this. Have you been able to study all the religions, all the worldviews in, uh, in existence to be sure that what, you are, what you're propagating is true? Is it not possible you have missed something in your studies? How do you know the Bible is true? Now, that sounds like a very daunting question, but the answer to it is not very difficult because all the worldviews in existence can really be grouped under three categories, depending on what they say about God, and the universe. Depending on what our worldview says about God and the universe, it falls under one of three categories. On the one extreme, you have the view that God doesn't exist 
only the universe exists, and under that you obviously have atheism. On the other extreme, you have the view, believe it or not, that only God exists. The universe doesn't exist. And then you ask the person, what about all the people and the cars and the trees and all that? And they will tell you this. Those are like drops out of the ocean. If you take a drop that is not in the ocean, put it back in the ocean, its individuality disappears, and everything is one, is all inclusive whole. Everything is one. And you find this in the Eastern regions, and it's very popular here in the U.S. today as in the form of the New Age movement. That's a position. That, that's, what it, that's what it leads to. In the middle, the serious views are this. Both God and the universe exist, God is eternal and uncaused, and the universe was created by God. And under that, you only have three categories. You have, you, you have uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So it's really not difficult to look at all these worldviews and classify them and critique them at the base without being an expert in all of them. So it's not difficult to answer that question. Now, we don't have the time to uh, critique these views individually. But I will tell you, based on what we know today, it's very difficult to sustain the claim that only the universe exists because the universe itself is pointing us to the existence of a reality beyond itself. This is undeniable today in science. And if you look at what they are telling us, for example, about the origin of the universe, they have come to the conclusion that this universe has not always existed. It is finite and it came from nothing. So what they are trying to do to explain this, there are only two explanations, not three or four, just two explanations. Either it was created by God, or the one of the most, uh, the pop most popular position is this. There are many universes out there, and ours happens to, to just have the right constant, the right arrangement scientifically to allow life. So multi either multiple universes, or it was created by God. One of the leading philosophers of the last century was... was uh, was Anthony Flew, and he said this uh, in, in, the, in his answer to the, to the view, because at the end, uh, towards the end of his life, he rejected the view that this universe was not created by God, and he said, given what we know about it, it must have been put together by an intelligent being, by God. And it's, what, so what did, why did he reject the multiple um, universe account? This is what he said. The postulation of multiple universes is a truly desperate alt alternative. If the existence of one universe requires an explanation, multiple universes require a much bigger explanation. The problem is increased by the factor of whatever the total number of universes is.